Good evening, everybody. You're very welcome to this webinar on downy mildew and fusarium and lettuce. Um, this is a topic that we've discussed in a previous webinar a couple of years back. Um, but managing these diseases remains at the forefront of growers' minds. Um, fusarium was a serious issue about five years ago. And despite some mitigation strategies, it continues to be a challenge. Um, so we're here to get an up, update on where, we're, where we are on the, on the fusarium front. But also downy mildew, on the other hand, has become an increasing uh, concern to the industry. Um, and there's been heavy losses uh, incurred by growers in some cases. So challenges include the weather we've had this year, evolving strains and the loss of a key uh, plant protection product, which you'll all be familiar with, Rhythm and Gold. So uh, before we get into that, though, I'm just going to share some housekeeping slides uh, that many of you might be familiar with, but we'll just run through them anyway. OK, so in case you aren't familiar with uh, these webinars, you're all on mute. We, uh, you can see us and hear us, hopefully, but we cannot see or hear you. Um, so we do rely on your engagement through the Q&A function there. That's just at the bottom of your screens. Um, the webinar is being recorded. Uh, for for anybody who wants to look back on on what you hear this evening, or if you know somebody that wasn't able to make it tonight, uh, it'll be available on the website in uh, the next uh, week or so. And uh, this webinar, you can also sign up for IASIS points, and there's an IASIS uh, a link to enter your details and sign up for IASIS points in the chat, uh, which is also available at the bottom of your screen. Um, that link will be there for the, the, the remainder of the, the webinar. So enter your details there. We will probably, <clears throat> excuse me, we'll probably run till about eight or quarter past eight. Uh, we'll see how we go depending on, on engagement. So again, make sure you get your questions in and uh, take advantage of the opportunity to, to ask uh, as many questions as you can this evening. So with that out of the way, um, we are, uh, I suppose, having said all of what we said about the, the, the challenges, we're here to look forward at, at solutions that are out there. And we're very lucky to be joined by two experts tonight. Um, John Johnson of Enzas Aiden, the UK Technical Sales Manager, uh, specialising in lettuce. And Andrew Poole, who is a leading salad, salad agronomist based in Essex in the UK. So they are going to give us presentations on downy mildew and fusarium which, as I said, will be followed by a Q&A session uh, after that. Uh, I'm also joined by my colleague, Andy Welton, who many of you will know. Uh, Andy's up there. Uh, and he's a specialised advisor based down in the south and southwest, covering across uh, vegetable crops, but ornamentals and a range of stuff, Andy, really. Um, so that's Andy. And also with us is another colleague, William DC who uh, he just joined us there in June as a specialised advisor. Um, William's based in Ennis in County Clare, and he comes to us with a PhD in IPM. Uh, he's also worked as an agronomist in Scotland, and before he joined us, he was uh, uh, working with the Irish Organics Association. So we're delighted to have William uh, join the team as well. So on that, before we get into our, uh, our, our speakers, William's going to just run through a quick poll which we we just uh, we ask for your participation and um, and your engagement just to to tee it up. So I'll hand over there to you, William. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone, and and welcome to the webinar this evening. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, as Owen said, we're we're going to run a short little poll, <clears throat> and it uh, just composed of three questions, um, and that we'll be hoping for to get your insight uh, from there at home. Um, I'm just going to launch the poll there now. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to read each question in, in turn and I'll read out the answers as well. Um, so the first question here, number one, is what is your lettuce production system? Um, outdoor, hydroponic protected, organic or soil protected? So you can tick the box as, as to which one of those is appropriate to yourself. Very good. Um, I'll just move on to, to question two. And this is a yes, no answer as such. So um, the question is, do you use decision support um, and or crop monitoring tools such as soil probes or moisture sensors or weather sensors? 
So you can choose yes or no there. To the final question here. Um, so from, from the list below, select the most important factor that will impact the disease management and lettuce, pr 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 lettuce production into the future. And it's a multiple choice, so you, you can choose more than one here. So I think we're, we're more or less there on this, I'd say. Um, and if for anybody who's thinking about it, you can still you can still add an answer in the last few seconds here before the before we close it. So there's a few late one com late ones coming in. So okay, we'll wrap it up there. So I'm just going to end the poll, and we'll we'll have a look at we'll have a look at the results. So for question one, um, uh, what is your lettuce production system? Seventy five percent of uh, of you are are growing uh, in soil protect protected soil crops. Um, forty-two percent outdoor. Um, tonight we don't have a hydroponic uh grower, or maybe 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 you missed the deadline there on on, on adding your on adding your vote. Um, and we have uh seventy percent of uh, uh who are uh, growing organically. So that's interesting. Um, on to question two. Um which was how many of you are are using decision support or crop monitoring tools to to um, and we're looking there at a relatively even split, uh, maybe a bit more uh, in terms of uh, not using decision support, but um, um, that's quite interesting in itself as well. 40% of you are using decision support and, and maybe later on in the discussion, we'll, we'll, or in the Q&A, we'll maybe establish, you know, which ones, which ones are what you're using. Um, and the final uh, answers to the final question um, on, on what, what factors you see as important into the future. Um, Certainly, um, availability of disease resistant varieties is, is a big one here for, for you um, and availability of plant protection products. Um, and also, the, when you look down here, uh, you know, the, the actual env uh, environmental control, of, of, you know, that's a big one as well. Um, and, and irrigation rotation and uh, plant intensity coming in there. So, so some interesting results. Um, so with that, I'll, 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 I'll pass over to Owen again and, and he'll introduce the Th thanks William thanks very much and thanks everybody for your participation in that and um, I suppose the, the answer there on the third question uh, tees up our next speaker quite nicely in terms of varieties um, the John uh, John Johnson uh, has been with Enza Zayden um, for ten and a half years he heads up the Iceberg Romaine and Glasshouse Lettuce uh, in the UK um, he's part of the global team with Enza in terms of their road to digital and this involves assessing trials remotely on digital devices He's, he was brought up in the industry in the northwest uh, around the Heskett Bank and Tarleton area, areas. Um, and he's over, he, he spent over 20 years with uh, Royal Sluice, which is now Seminus, uh, both in open field and in later years ornamentals. So um, plenty of experience there, John, and lots of knowledge. So we'll be delighted to, to, to hear your presentation. And um, over to you when you're ready. Yep. Uh, thank you for the invite. Uh, again, it doesn't seem that long ago since uh, we were discussing the fuse <coughs> fusarium outbreak. Anyway, <clears throat> just get into the slides. Thank you. Uh, just basically, uh, this will just be an overview over the last 12 months, 18 months uh, with updates, results. This will come from James Hutton Institute and some of the diagnostics we carried out in, in Holland. And it'll cover results both uh, UK, Holland, and Ireland as well. So just a quick overview. Uh, the present numbers are 38, 39, and 40, which gives basically, we've reviewed that now, it's 29 to 40. Now, who nominates these? It's IBAPT. Now, it's just to give an overview of how we get to the nominations of the strains. So this is a cooperation between the seed houses uh, and co and the new nominate new numbers are nominated between the seed houses. That nomination uses is carried out the first week of, of December, uh, and some of those discussions were carried out last week with guarding, which will come on to a later time with the new numbers that have perceived with the outbreaks in this last twelve months. 
Now, each of those numbers, so Bremia 29, 30, 31, etc., cetera, given individual sex tests. Now, they're shared between all the seed companies, so they can test their varieties against uh, the Bremia's resistance they've got in the present varieties and what, what is missing. So that's how we come to nominate, you know, the last three numbers, which was 12 months ago, which was a 38, 39, and 40. Um, now, the spread of those new numbers for, was first appeared uh, in early part of Spain in 2022, as you can see, and the latter part in the rest of Europe in 2022. So you can see the red dots. We, so they were in Spain, all across mainland Europe, on the, which, and then within Ireland, the northwest of the UK, and the southern part of, uh, of the UK. Now, if we go the ones with circulated with no fill, they were then uh, outbreaks in 22 and 23. They were on the middle of the UK and the eastern part of the UK. And what is interesting, we've not really had any severe outbreaks in Scotland, but that's, you know, there's only one particular gro large grower in, in Scotland, that's kettle, kettle produce. They have had some outbreaks, but not to the extent that we've had both in Ireland, UK, mainland Europe uh, and Spain. So that's how basically the correlation of these last outbreaks, the, the 39 to 40, and the present uh, 40 plus and plus uh, that are coming about. So we come on to those results. Now, what I have left out of here is the varieties because some of those varieties were tested by ENSA of competitive companies. And I didn't think it was fair to list uh, those varieties within this chart and the, the preceding chart. So these ones were carried out in, in Holland. Um, and the ones, the, the next slide will show, this was done by James Hutton Institute in, in Scotland. Now, because of Brexit, we, the UK, have difficulty sending samples over to, may, uh, to, this, um, to seed houses in Europe, and that includes ourselves. This is the exception of the Irish growers. You can actually, and I'll come to this on my last slide, where you can actually have those samples sent up to the individual seed houses in 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 Europe, whether that's the cells, Rax One, Nunnums, or whichever variety you're using, whether that's in glasshouse production or open field. So in the UK, we had Enza uh, Zaden partnered up with Azira, Syngenta, Gautier, which is Agility. And we had all those tested within James Sutton Institute, which is the Scottish Institute up in, in Scotland. So um, just bear with me. Uh, so the new nominates in 20 for 2024. Uh, presently, the information got out of the meeting last week. They are not going to nominate the new 40 plus and the 40 plus plus. So that may change in the coming months, but because it's been, it's not been across Europe, it's been in isolated spots within Europe, and because they need several repetitions, so that's how they come up with the new nominees. Uh, and these basically were taken by samples across various companies in various regions. Now, the samples are on the screen here, they were taken uh, by Europrise and sent to our labs in, in the Netherlands. And this was by yourselves, Enza Zaden. So you can see there, there was uh, results from Ireland, which was the BL40 strain, which was which uh, was broken there. The ones in Suffolk, um, this is in the UK, were broken. Now the bottom one, which is the interesting one, uh, this came out of Ireland. I can, uh, so you see the resistance strains there. You had 29, 30, 33 to 35, 37, 38, and 40. wasn't broken by 40, but the, a preceding 27. So it was Premier 27, which by recollection, I think, was quite heavily an outbreak in the northwest of the UK and Ireland in preceding years. So even though it was broken, even though it was a mild outbreak, it basically 
you can still have old variety, old Bremia strains being broken, even those that variety didn't have Bremia 27 in its resistant packages. So where you have the 40 varieties, they were basically broken by the uh, 40 strain. So the ones by James Sutton Institute that I'm showing you now, so basically you can see the various sex tests. So the 62 to 31, basically that is a variant. So that's 40 plus. Um, and then there's other, other uh, Bremia says so you've got 30, 38. So it's where it says novel, that's where it's 40 plus and possibly 27 plus plus where it's been broken. So Bremia, as you can see, is not a simple as you know we can say of oh, this variety is resistant to xyz in some cases it may have been broken by a previous one in 27 so the previous one with the novel strain which was broken in 27 that came out of lancashire um which was basically an old a, a variety that's been around numerous years probably 20 uh, 10 plus years that was broken by 27, but it was a mild outbreak, but it wasn't broken by 40. So it was to give you an overview of the samples that were taken on this particular one of the outbreak, both in Lancashire, um, eastern, eastern counties, southern counties, and the Midlands. So proposals for 2024. Um, and this is basically, I'm aiming this at the Irish growers. Any outbreaks can be sent via Europrize. This is in case of uh, Enz and Zayden. If it's any other seed houses, I'm assuming they'd be con uh, collated by uh, Gold Crop and sent to the various labs that they represent in, in Ireland. Um, spraying. This is a question that's commonly asked by myself because, oh, we've got the new. You know, we've got the full, basically, 29 to 40 strains. We don't need to spray. We can probably go on to this later. We don't need to spray. My recommendation, you still have to carry on spraying, even though you have full resistant varieties. And basically, this helps guard against any future outbreak. And, yes, resistance does make the difference. And as you can see uh, on the picture there, this was an outbreak last year of Bremia 40 against a zip. A resistant variety so you know disease resistant varieties are important but i must you know reiterate that spraying does help prevent further outbreaks and further strains uh, breaking down i think that's soon that's about all okay for me if there's any questions i'm assume they'll be probably later or within this session that's brilliant. Uh, thanks very much there, John, for that. Uh, lots of challenges uh, for, a, for a plant breeder. Um, and I think that the combination of, of spraying and uh, I suppose your, your, your plant protection program uh, in combination with resistant varieties and a whole lot of other uh, factors is probably something that we will... Um, We'll touch on later, and and I'd encourage everybody again to to st send questions into the Q and A down the bottom. We're going to go to our second speaker, uh, though for the moment. Um, uh, thanks very much, John, for, for that presentation. Um, we're going to go. We're going to go to our second speaker for the moment. We'll come back, John, then later for, for questions, which I'm sure they'll be coming in. Um, but our our second speaker tonight is um, is Andrew Poole. Um. Andrew is uh, Andrew studied at Rittle Agricultural College in the early 90s before returning to the family farm where a wide range of veg and salads were, were being grown. Um, from there, Andrew joined Anglia Salads, a large UK-based lettuce farm where speciality lettuce was grown and he became technical manager, which led to him adopting the agronomist role as well. Um, in 2009, he left Anglia Salads and became an independent agronomist and he now looks after a range of protected and outdoor speciality crops of whole head lettuce and baby leaves and also some protected hydroponic uh, lettuce production. So, um, Andrew, we're, we're delighted to have you um, and thanks very much for joining us as well. Um, and I'll hand it over to you if you can share your presentation and when you're ready, please. Okay, thanks for the intro. 
Owen, I'll uh, do, 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 do. right. Hopefully, you can see that. That's perfect, Andrew. Thanks. Now, yeah, super job. Okay, uh, so good evening, everybody. Um, I'm Andrew Paul. I'm an independent agronomist. Uh, oh, we're not moving on screens. Sorry. not moving on for you Andrew isn't it no at the moment do you want to try to stop sharing and, and reshare possibly yeah, yeah. I'll do it again yeah no problem. sorry the joys of uh, of <laughs> of webinars no yes yeah. that one share okay let's get rid of that And no, it's not moving on. Just okay. maybe try one more time, Andrew. Um, but okay. if you go out and just check the the, the PowerPoint, uh, that it's not something that you've you've shared before. It's 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 the original, the original PowerPoint. Sometimes that does happen. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. Aha. Uh -huh. Can you see that? Not, no. not yet, no. No, oh dear. Uh, okay, sorry everyone. It's no problem. Back onto here. Go there. Bear with. Uh, if needs be, Andrew, I can share. But yeah. if, try try it there one more time, and 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 if if not, don't worry, I I can share. Yeah. Uh, I can right. share. I think I have your most up to date slides. Um, uh, yeah, you got most of them, I think. Uh, how embarrassing. Uh, hang on, let me just go over here. If I can bring it up again, talk amongst yourselves for a moment. That's not what it. It's uh, look. Everyone has has uh, plenty of food for thought after. After the previous presentation, <laughs> actually, uh, this is a good chance, everybody, to get your questions in and um, register for IASIS points there along the side. It's just posted in the chat if if you want to. Um, also, uh, just as a, a as a quick note, the, the the presentation or the the webinar, the recording of the webinar that we did previously on uh, Downey Mildew, and I see something coming up now. But the recording that we did previously on Downey Mildew and uh, Fasarium is still on the Chagas website. If anybody wants to look back at the notes um, from that one, but um, looks like you're going there, Andrew. Is it moving along? Yeah, here we go. Perfect. Joy of technology. So you're quite, all right, thanks very much. Thanks for being with me. Okay, uh, so good evening. I'm Andrew Paul. I'm an independent agronomist specialising in outdoor and protective specialty leafy salads and baby leaf crops. Uh, I'm based in the southeast of the UK, about 60 miles north of London in Essex. Uh, I look after monocropped Apollo lettuce, uh, planted and grown in glass houses using plastic mulch, as you can see in the photo here. Uh, Plants hand planted through the polythene, which is for weed suppression uh, and to reduce soil contact and contamination of the plants. Uh, I look after outdoor lettuce crops too. Uh, these ones are planted about one mile from the east coast, just up the road from me in Suffolk, where the soil is very sandy, free draining, and we see increased sunlight reflected off the sea. Uh, despite the good grain conditions, this crop went on to become heavily infected with downy mildew. Uh, as the weather conditions deteriorated and we were unable to apply all parts of our fungicide programme. Uh, I look after a large hydroponic lettuce unit's agronomy. Uh, this one's about uh, one and a half hectares of floating raft deep pool lettuce, uh, currently 99.9% .9 Apollo. Uh, this is being grown uh, to supply specialist customers such as sandwich makers and food services where contamination control is of the utmost importance. This unit has its own high care facilities attached directly to the production area, and the lettuce are prepared on site, packed into sealed bags, and then ready to be directly used as sandwich fillings in the factories. Uh, vertical hydroponics, uh, trial area where lettuce, again, um, Apollo mainly, 
are planted into the columns and irrigated by means of a nutrient solution being injected from the top of the column from where it then percolates through all layers of the plants. Uh, this system is supplied by satin bioponics. Uh, the high density of such systems give rise to low airflow and high disease pressure from downy and powdery mildew. And this is one reason why fans have been introduced to increase airflow. Circulating fans help to even up the temperature and humidity around the crop, but moisture can only be removed by introducing cooler, drier air from outside, adding heat or by dehumidification. Horizontal fans blow air along the, bay, along the bays, while vertical fans will blow air from the top of the glass house down into the crop to create a more even vertical temperature distribution. And these could be used in conjunction with horizontal fans placed under benches. For any system, it is important to have the fans and their positioning design bespoke to your own site. Most systems will aim to turn the air over at least twice per hour. Fusarium. This planting of Apollo grew on okay initially, but areas became stunted with pale lower leaves as the crop developed. Initially, it looked like Fusarium, so I sent some samples to Ferrer's plant clinic where Pythium was discovered. There's always pythium in the soil, so no real surprise they found it. A type of fusarium was detected, but the lab indicated it did not resemble fusarium oxysporum lactosae on this occasion. However, I noticed some points that may have contributed to the infection of the plants. Irrigation had been sporadic and variable. The responsibility of irrigation had been split between two people with slightly different views on soil moisture management. The plants have been left in trays on site for a prolonged period pre-planting and the blocks are dried, then been re-wetted, then underwatered, and then overwatered once planted. Fusarium pythium enter a plant via wounded plant material. And whenever I've seen such infections, I can usually relate it back to a drought period where the soil EC would have risen due to the dry conditions, therefore causing scorch to the roots, and this will have provided a route in for the pathogens. An application of Amistar helped the roots overcome that damage. Um, and from here, the plant centers began to grow on again. This particular site has already adopted a very strict hygiene policy where visitors are kept to a minimum and those who do enter the production areas are supplied with shoe covers or company issued boots. Uh, a couple of potential fusarium controls that may be worth investigating further are uh, Integral Pro, a uh, biofungicide seed treatment containing Bacillus amylo liquefaciens by BASF. It's predominantly used on oilseed rate, and we have an emu in the UK for application to lettuce seed, but I don't think you have it um, in the rest of the EU currently. Uh, Zandu are a company carrying out cold plasma seed treatment using activated air. Uh, the process is for improving seed health and increasing seedling growth. Uh, I've not had direct contact with them yet, but uh, certainly I think there's mileage uh, when I put their my mileage in contact with them, and there's their website address there. Uh, I've also heard of smoke water. Uh, it's based around the chemicals released during wildfires, which in turn promote new seedling growth. Uh, there's information online which makes for interesting reading, but that's as far as I've got with it so far. But uh, maybe something for the future. Down in Mildew have been very prevalent this year in the UK and quickly became one of the biggest challenges growers currently face in lettuce production. Humidity above 85% during cool conditions of 15 to 20 degrees C are prime conditions for downy mildew development. Uh, IPM points, I'll go on to explain each of these. Uh, so resistant varieties uh, should be given high priority in choosing which varieties to grow. Uh, be prepared to trial varieties and repeat the trials throughout the season to see uh, when they perform the best in your own uh, requirements. Uh, controlling the environment, uh, soil, uh, allow good drainage to prevent anaerobic conditions. Uh, irrigation, there are decision support systems available which can be telemade to include different sensors that monitor the soil moisture at different depths, as well as monitor the environment and the crop itself too. Soil moisture sense, 
our wealth of experience and provide such tailor-made sensors. And growers here are using their services across the UK. I understand they also cover uh, the Republic of Ireland. Uh, I can forward some details to Owen to send around. I've got a presentation from Soil Moisture Centre, which might be interesting for you to have a look at. Uh, I've had experience with the Zensi system, uh, which is now available from Fargro. It's very adaptable with lots of different options and widgets to choose from and gives a good overview of the climate across the nursery. This opens up another level of insight into the crop's environment and the crop itself. And there are options to make notes, take photos, build up a detailed picture of how the crop is performing. Fargro's advisors have a good understanding of grain crops and will be able to help you navigate around the Zensi system so as you get the best information out of it that relates to your own growing system. Uh, a grower can then build on this information in order to continually fine tune the growing operation. I must say I'm not paid by uh, Soil Moisture Sense or around um, Zensi and Fargo. It's just uh, my own experiences. Uh, airflow. Airflow to reduce humidity. Uh, aim to clear condensation quickly in the morning by using some of the residual heat inside the structure coupled to venting. Generally, only sea frost protection being employed in lettuce production with heaters coming on in the early morning as temperatures dip as the sun rises. Growers use this residual heat to clear the condensation once the structure warms through the morning by cracking open the vents. They then close the vents down later in the day once the humidity has dropped in order to trap some of the sun's warmth before nightfall. Hygiene is of great importance. Carrying over disease on crop remains is a sure way of infecting subsequent crops. So destroy or remove crop residues as soon as possible after harvest. Keep well, weeds well controlled and sanitise machinery when travelling between sites. Uh, soil sterilising. Steam sterilising is effective at reducing soil-borne pathogens such as fusarium and where crop residues remain it helps reduce the green bridge of disease carryover. Wheat seed viability is reduced too. Calcium cyanamide is used by some growers to suppress weeds and also so sterilise soil-borne issues. It has specific application and following crop timings so ensure these are adhered to for best results or it can negatively impact the following crop. Because sterilising is non-selective, it's useful to repopulate the soil with beneficial microbes in order to competitively, competitively exclude soil-borne pathogens. Uh, and this can be done with such products as Serenade ASO or Trianum, for example. Nutrition. Uh, know what's in your soils by soil sampling and analyse at the same time every year. RB209 guidelines are a good place to aim for, although there are more detailed analysis available from specialist companies now. Often agrochem companies are now offering these along with individual interpretation. Uh, I don't associate any specific nutrient deficiency with Danny Mildew, but I do aim for a fit plant. I've mentioned here, which can be assessed through leaf nutrient analysis. I take leaf samples throughout the year, say every couple of months, um, just before harvest, to check the offtake by the crop and also check for any deficiencies that might be manifesting. An example of how I've trended soil analysis results over time. Uh, in particular, uh, you'll see CF down the bottom right refers to conductivity or salts in the soil and this is something we've tried to reduce over time in order to reduce the potential for high salt levels which can scorch roots during dry periods. Adjusting the fertiliser programme and flushing the soil with irrigation between crops helped in this example. Reducing the soil conductivity if it's high then reduces the potential for root scorch as I mentioned previously. Fertiliser and nutrition. Blends of nutrients or straights are applied pre-planting in response to soil analysis results with blends made up for bigger areas or straights used in smaller units. Usually granulars are used, uh, sorry, usually granulars are used, although some growers like liquids as they're easy to apply with a sprayer over larger areas. 
Uh, some organic type pellets from heat treated waste can be tried. Um, when aim, oh sorry, some organic type pellets made from heat treated waste have been tried when aiming to reduce the soil EC with some success. Usually, all nutrition is applied in the bed pre pre planting. Generally, these are applied, let's say, once in the instance of structures that only produce one early and one late season crop. For more intense cropping, we apply the blend or straights, say once every two crops, depending upon soil analysis results. Calcium nitrate is often used as the nitrogen supply for each crop and is placed in the bed pre-planting. There may be an argument for top dressing of calcium nitrate half to three quarters of the way through a crop's life particularly on sandy soil, to ensure the nitrogen doesn't run out just before harvest. Fungicide programs. Apply spray plants in the best conditions possible to get the best effect from them. Amistar is a good start to a fungicide program, but there's a maximum amount of azoxystrobium permitted per hectare per year, so I tend to keep it for the first and last of the protected plantings. Amistar controls a range of diseases, including Danny mildew, and it's also helped the roots of the glasshouse planting in the earlier slide where Fusarium was suspected. Apply as soon after planting as possible. And uh, now Arondis Plus is now approved in the UK for outdoor plantings, but it's not in the EU so far. I've not used it, but others have, and have said it will help swell towards the control of Danny mildew. Uh, this is an example of a fairly full winter spray program using UK approvals. Uh, fairly self-explanatory, I hope, but don't worry about copying it all down as I'll send Owen a copy of my presentation, which you're um, you know, happy to have. Uh, looking at this program, uh, I understand you don't have few bowl um, or ready mill gold anymore, so I'd consider applying Infinito instead. Um, instead of Mark 850, Lambda Cyhalothrin, I'd use Desis Protec, which I can't use in the UK, but only apply if there are actually caterpillar aphid present. Uh, it's difficult to give a prescriptive program as timing is always different, but I usually aim to apply the majority of this type of program for winter production, carrying out applications every seven to ten days, weather permitting. Uh, for example, in very cold conditions, if the crop has stopped growing, I hold off of all applications until a suitable spray window comes along. Uh, thinking about water rates, I aim for about 350 litres per hectare in most instances, unless the label says you use more. Often the water rate is dictated by the application equipment and operator, if being applied through handheld apparatus. So sometimes the lowest we can aim for is six to 700 litres per hectare in practice, but essentially go as low as possible with a view to getting good coverage and for the product to dry on the leaf before nightfall. Uh, Karma, potassium hydrogen carbonate, uh, is great at drying infection, although relies on good contact with the spores. In some crops, say wild rocket, for example, where Danny mildew pressure is very high in the late summer into autumn, I apply Karma, say, three to four days after the main fungicide applications, in order to reduce spores before I see them, especially when in a structure that has sequential crops planted next to each other or at different growth stages. I then repeat the karma application at seven day intervals, and this could be done when Danny Mildred is getting a hold in lettuce planting too. Uh, this is an example of a protected summer, pro summer spray program. Uh, as with the winter program, this type of schedule will be adopted and applied on an approximate seven day interval basis. Uh, lunar sensation is relatively new in the UK and is good against powdery mildew. In its absence, I'll be applying bacillus products such as Amylo X and also sulfur, which I'll come on to in a minute. Uh, you'll see I have Serenade ASO in here, and I do alternate this with Amylo X and Tegro could be used instead or as well. I haven't found any one of the bacillus products to be better than another in my practical experience, but I do avoid mixing them with regular fungicides as these can hinder the bacillus's survival. Keeping plants fighting fit. 
the phosphate contained products of hortified and nutrified appear to keep the plants in good health and able to resist a degree of disease attack. They're not curative and heavy lifting of protection is certainly done by the main fungicide program. I tend to start applying the phosphites after the other plant protection products have all been applied. Uh, the foliar nutrition helps to make up for any slight deficiencies and also helps to keep the plants progressing and looking green up to harvest. And foliar sulphur helps the leaf to shed moisture, which then impedes powdery mildew spread for sure, and possibly assists with any mildew suppression in a similar manner too. Uh, there's more information available online. Uh, the UK's Agriculture and Horticultural Development Board has been replaced by the new HCP, Horticultural Crop Protection Limited, but the AHDB has a really good legacy website with lots of past work and DDLT information on all crop topics, if you've not seen it before. Uh, the new HCP has been lined up to take over where AHDB left off. I've got lots of projects in the wings waiting for them to strike off. Um, that's a real whistle stop to my economy in the UK. I uh, hope you found it somewhat useful. Thanks very much, Andrew. Um, a lot of detail there. Some very, very interesting uh, slides and probably more now that we can, can elaborate on. Uh, there's some questions coming in already for both John and Andrew. Um, and I encourage them to keep coming. Uh, you know, this is this is your webinar, and uh, essentially, and you know, it's up. To, oh, 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 I suppose you want to get the most out of it, so fire them in. Um, I'll just pass over to Andy. There is there is there any questions, Andy, that that you'd like to ask uh, at this stage? Thanks, Owen. Yeah. Um. Thanks very much, um, Andrew and and John, <clears throat> for the presentations. Yeah, there is one here. Um, for John, I think John. There's a question in regards to the testing. You mentioned about it being done in, in the John Inns Institute or the, Hutt, uh, the excuse, James Hutton Institute in Scotland, excuse yeah. me. What is, what's the procedure? Is that done on both outdoor and indoor? And yeah. What's the kind of recording? Is it purely focused on the downy mildew? Um, it's purely, um, on, uh, purely on downy mildew. Purely on downy mildew. And yeah. is there obviously then the varieties are also tested on in 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 the locations, are they? I mean, it's just gone through um, my mind here is the where where there might be more pressure, say in Lancashire and are in these other sort of intensive grown areas. Is there much testing done there in the initial stages? No, no there's no test. You can't test for that. All the testing is done. All the sampling is taken. Uh, they are then bagged on the day. Uh, sent 24 hours. They were then received by James Hutton Institute uh, in the UK. If they were tested in Ireland, uh, what we 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 ends a partner with uh, Europrise in Ireland. So John Cale, who most of the growers know and yourselves know, he would then send, take a sample, or the growers would then uh, drop a sample off at Europrise. They then. Uh, process that because they have forms to fill in what the variety is, where the grower is, if there's any fungicides been uh, used in the last week or in the last three weeks or what would, when was the last fungicide done. They are then sent to our lab in uh, Enzer Zayden in Enkhausen and they are tested tested from there. So it's the same, it's this, exactly the same test whether it's done in Holland or a James Hutton Institute. But because of the Brexit, that's where we had, had to find uh, a source in the UK for uh, testing facilities, and they liaise with our uh, path <laughs> path labs in uh, path labs in Holland. Excellent, that's great. Thanks for that, uh, John. Um, I might just ask one or two others before I hand over to William, if that's all right. Um, uh, Andrew touched on an awful lot of um, important detail in the cultivation and growing side, but there's a couple of questions. One in particular on the the spraying program, um, Andrew, um, um, attendee here asking about whether you'd um, recommend using an adjuvant in each spray uh, round to improve efficacy. Hmm. Um, good question. I very, very rarely use an adjuvant uh, purely because I find that um, salads and vegetable crops can be quite sensitive to 
uh, scorch. Um, so the basic answer is no, I, I very, very rarely use one unless it's in with a herbicide and I'm spraying off with glyphosate, for example, really. Um, yeah. So no, just for the fear of, of inflicting scorch, um, you know, during spraying, I, uh, I, I steer clear of, of all adjuvants. And maybe just a quick follow on on that one, you know, what method of spraying is used for applying fungicides uh, to indoor lettuce grass? Uh, yeah, so depending on the size of the setup, um, one of the guys I look after has got somewhere in the region of 75 acres uh, of, of polytunnels um, and uh, he's using a tractor mounted boom sprayer um, up and down his bays. Um, and uh, the the glasshouse grown Apollo that we were looking at with the uh, polythene and the potential fusarium, uh, that's all done with a uh, hand lance, um, uh, you know, a, a sprayer parked on the headland, um, guy pulling the hose, um, and a guy holding the lance walking up and down the rows, uh, you know, spraying from side to side. Um, and that's also the similar sort of method to how we were treating the, the vertically grown Apollo as well in the hydroponics. We had a special boom made up, which uh, on a trolley pushed down between the uh, the rows. Uh, again, yeah. yeah, done by a guy, guy sort of doing it manually. Um, someone else helping by pulling the hose in and out for him. So, okay. yeah, there's a range of range of options. Okay, very good. Um, maybe William, I'd hand over to you. There's a few more on the on the. Um lines there. Thank you, Andy. And thanks, Andrew and John, for, for a great presentation. Um, there's a question here, if we go, go back to nutrition for, for Andrew. Um, how often do you take soil samples, Andrew, And typically? Yeah, so um, when one of the sites um, was in its infancy, we were literally soil sampling after every crop, um, just to get a feel for the, uh, for the new site, um, what the, the crop was taking away, uh, what we were missing, uh, we were really sort of micromanaging it. Um, and then over time, we've really spread that out. Um, I went to sort of every, let's say, every six months. Um, and as a matter of course, now I do it every year. Um, but that's not to say I'm sampling every single area um, every year. I, I've, I've broadened the, uh, the areas that I uh, sample. So let's say, for example, in a, in a big, structure there were 20 bays um you know to start with i was perhaps sampling every five bays um and now i've got it down uh, or every five bays every year um but now um i sort of got a bit more confidence with the site um and i'm sampling the whole tunnel so the whole 20 bays um on an annual basis just really trying to keep an eye on what's happening um nip any deficiencies in the bud as quickly as possible um, and build that picture up that I showed you with the graphs, just, you know, understanding my trends, um, see, you know, want to be ahead of my pH dropping off suddenly, which it did in one one year, um, keep an eye on the conductivity, um, and just, yeah, have a, a good overview of, of my nutrient sort of situation, really. So, yeah, every year. <laughs> Great. Uh, we, we had a question in here for yourself as well, Andrew, again, uh, again on nutrition. Um, just a question on how many units of uh, nitrogen typically are used uh, for your, in your glasshouse and outdoor crops? Um, uh -huh. um, and is urea widely used in protected crops? Yeah, we don't tend to use urea. Um, like I said, we tend to major on the calcium nitrate, probably because it's on site. You can use it as a top dressing. Um, it's quite kind to the crop, provides a bit of calcium as well. Um, and we're aiming... My soil science guy who I have come in on the bigger sites, um, he he aims for sort of 90 kilos of nitrogen um, per hectare for a crop. Um, we did drop it down to that, um, but we did find that the nitrogen was just sort of running out just at harvest. So we've upped it again to sort of 110, 120. Um, and it's similar outside as well, actually, for the whole head production. So, um, yeah, around 100, 120 um kilos of nitrogen per hectare is what we're aiming for good yeah um just you mentioned um you mentioned ec management and uh i suppose keeping plants fit and and and, and mm. uh, not stressing plants um 
I suppose that that to some extent is linked to watering and irrigation as well. And uh, can you mm. just develop uh, or elaborate on 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 your your advice in that in that sense? Yeah. Um, so I mean, it depends on the soil type. I mean, I'm quite accustomed to looking after some really sandy, gravelly soils here, so uh, water flows through pretty freely. Um, what I was noticing was we sort of adopted a bit of a regime where we'd uh, drill or plant a crop, irrigate it heavily, walk away for a few days, um, and then you know come back and hope everything was okay. But what was actually happening was the very top of the soil was drying out quite quickly, especially on bright, warm or windy days. Um, and we were breaking that sort of layer of moisture, if you like, that the, the, the plant's roots required, either coming out of a block or the plant root coming out of the seed. Um, it just wasn't following the moisture fast enough. So we did tend to apply irrigation um, more frequently in the early days. Um, and then using soil moisture probes from Soil Moisture Sense, we can see where the moisture is in the soil. We're also going out with augers and, and physically checking the soil and just making sure that the root is always in contact with a bit of moisture. Um, I don't mean flood the soil, of course, but, um, you know, just have a nice um, moist soil um, where, you know, and then we're not inflicting that scorch on the root. That's something that I picked up on a few years ago. We were... Uh, desperately trying to apply as many fungicides as we could early on as soon as the seedlings were coming out and uh, we were drying the soil back so we could dry through with the sprayer um, and in fact we were our own worst enemies we were drying back the soil the ec was shooting up in the root zone we were scorching the root um pythium was getting in phytophthora um and yeah we were really sort of like i say our own worst enemies so we stand back with the um the fungicides a bit more now um irrigate Little and often to start with, keep that top, um, you know, a few centimetres moist until the roots are out. Um, and then we start to increase the volumes over time. Um, and, yeah, basically get the roots to, to chase the moisture down. Could I just throw one in there, Andrew? You mentioned in your, your presentation on the, S, in the EC, I think, um, um, a heat-treated pellet, organic pellet, that is mm. is, is being trialled to reduce... EC. Yeah. What's what's the um what's yeah. the story there? Well it's um EC. Um my understanding is that the the EC, the salts in the soil are added to by um fertilizer applications. So you, you know your bagged fertilizer has a certain amount of salt within it. Mm -hmm. Um whereas we were thinking that the organic fertilizer made up of pellets of yes different waste streams that are added to it you know to, to make these pellets um they haven't got the the salt content in them um and we've seen the ec drop since you know since adopting those okay okay that's interesting yeah. and can i just ask one final one before handing back to you there on um you mentioned about the leaf sampling andrew as part of the mm. kind of management in terms of nutrition like, do you have benchmark data or values that you 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 compare and contrast to um, in terms of yeah. winter or summer and winter crops? Yeah, I mean, luckily I use um, NRM laboratories in the UK, um, and it's quite a straightforward process. I, I take some leaves, stick them in a bag, send them in the post, and they come back with a pre-populated graph, uh, okay. which shows um, you know the target. Uh, yeah, target nutrient indexes that that, that particular crop should have in it. Um, yeah. But I mean, I've also over time done similar to the soil sampling, really. I've, I've kind of tailored it a little bit to my own requirements as well. So if I've seen a crop growing really well, um, you know, I've, I've noted what uh, what's in the leaf um, and then borne that in mind and I've compared it with the, the NRM laboratory analysis. So, um, right. you know, I'm using both... Um, both my own experience and and the labs um, advice as well. So, okay. yeah, good, good, thanks, Very Andrew. Good. Uh, one for for John there, uh, John. Uh, kind of two questions rolled into one here, if you don't mind. Um, uh, are we have we got a, a, an over reliance on just a couple of varieties, and is this a risk? Um, and also, what what's new? Uh, I suppose in the variety scene. 
Uh, I know there's not um, other uh, representatives. I don't know whether uh, representatives from other seed houses uh, are present on here. Um, I can, and I'll be quite honest with regards to the 40 plus uh, that has outbreak, well, 40 plus plus that we can mention because they're not announcing the uh, new strains. Uh, what, from an ENSA point of view, we have been stacking genes for a number of years. So with regards to the Bremia strains, some type, some, if I can take uh, a variety called Coventry, for instance, that's a 20-year-old variety. That has 20, 90, 29 to 40 in its armory. But it doesn't mean to say when you've got a severe outbreak, there will be a breakdown of the, some of those varieties uh, that we've seen this year. So going back to that, that question, ENSA are working on new glasshouse material, both butterhead and um, gem varieties with further advanced strains with fusarium resistance. Um, and for ENSA, how we claim fusarium resistance, it um at the moment, there's not collaboration between the seed houses as there are with uh, Bremia. So there's no standard test to say which strain is this fusarium one or four, which the the main prevalent one. One is mainly seen in the Euro, uh, southern European parts uh, of uh, uh, of Europe. Four is within the glasshouse. So if we take Butterhead glasshouse, um, Right Swan had two or three varieties a couple of years ago with uh, Duca, and we have uh, Butterhead with regards to Jones. Uh, now, with regards to that, that has limited Bremia strains, but we are working on new Bremia varieties, uh, which with have that Jones strain in it, which is has a very strong resistance to Fusarium 4. Uh, and we would probably say Jones is probably the major butterhead used within UK and Ireland. And if you look at the UK growers, of all the UK growers, I'd say there's 95% growers that have fusarium in the soil. I've only known of one grower that doesn't have fusarium in, in, in his soil. But what he's using is using a mixture of, say, Jones, for instance, and standard varieties, say, from Rikeswan and uh, Nunnams. This is the summer months where you actually see the severity of the outbreak of Fusarium. If you come to Bremia, um, the 40 and the, well, 38, 39 and 40 and the new plus pluses, that has caught a lot of seed houses um not off guard, but it has caught them unawares. It's you know it's come out of the blue, to be honest with you. And I can honestly say there's a severe outbreak of Bremia probably every 10 to 15 years. And I'm not going back to when I first come across Bremia, uh, growing on my parents' nursery back in 19 Oak Cape, but... It was Bremia 11, which was a severe outbreak. We saw Bremia 27. And when you see, if it, see a severe outbreak like we, we have been seeing at the moment, it puts strains on all those resistant varieties. So, yes, there was 27 that was broken, but that's an old strain. If you see that picture I, I put up on the uh, in my slides, in there, there, was two, there were two gem varieties. Now, they didn't have... Um, some have tolerance to fusarium, and I'll come back to how we we measure to, uh, tolerance of fusarium. So, but that was taken last year. Now, one of those varieties, uh, three months prior to that, didn't have thirty-seven, so it it broke down with thirty-seven. So, three months after that, when forty hit. And that particular grower can, couldn't control that Bremia outbreak all through the winter months because of the severity of the attack of uh, Bremia 40, and that's how severe it was. So it just goes to show, even though you've got resistant varieties there, one may have a missing number, like I said, three months prior, the opposite happened to those varieties. One got Bremia, didn't. Six months after, the 40 was worse. So 
for Enza to claim that we've got resistance to fuse going back into fusarium, that we've got resistance to fusarium one and four, it has to be grown on soils that are known to have fusarium one and four. It's not done on the lab. We can actually test on, and I've done tests before on uh, fusarium resistant, resistant varieties that have been tested in the lab. When they're testing the soil in the soil, the soil can be so severe it'll break down so we know when we, we claim that it's got fusarium one and uh, four we know it st has strong yeah. resistances and in spain we test it for one and four so we, we we use varieties that have one and four resistance we have varieties that are resistant to one and not four and vice versa so if it breaks down we with one we know it's got fusarium four resistance and vice yeah. versa. So yeah. that's how we we test it. That's uh, yes, yeah, good good insight there into into I suppose the, the you know you need to get get diseases tested I suppose when they when they crop up. Um, so that's uh, thanks, John. Um, just going back to to Andrew there. Uh, just a question, another one that's just come in. Um, you know, most of the soil lettuce growers, Andrew, uh, protected soil lettuce growers, um, are using overhead irrigation. Um, you know, should they be looking at drip irrigation? You know, there there are some protected lettuce or protected uh, growers in Ireland using drip irrigation, but it's it's not that common. Should they be using it for a disease control point of view? Yeah, I mean, certainly it would help. Um, you know, with leaf wetness, which is something we're always trying to avoid. Um, yeah, there's work going on. Um, it's just to, to you know to get people to convert over to it, I suppose. Um, most people here are still using overhead irrigation just because it's, it's um, it, you know, it's already in the glass houses, it's in the polytunnels, um, and laying out uh, drip irrigation is expensive, um, and yeah, it takes a lot of time to, to lay out, pick up again, etc. Um, but yeah, anything you can do to obviously reduce that leaf wetness time would would be ideal. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's uh, possibly. Would it be more? Uh, would it be more effective at the shoulders of the season, or you know, for winter crops where, you know, I suppose in the autumn time where the crops going in for a longer period, you know, you could maybe justify the labour possibly. But I know you then you're you're looking at being set up for both systems in in a way. But yeah. is, is is that something that the, the the UK growers are considering, or is it? I suppose the uh, labour outweighs it. Yeah, I mean, I haven't haven't heard of of doing both to be honest um not specifically but um yeah I mean, if you could justify using it in the higher risk periods um and then just using your overhead um you know in the summer when there's less risk um yeah why not anything to sort of save money but also to um uh yeah save the pressure on the crop from disease infection so um yeah that's brilliant thanks andrew well, one from that um um, Andrew, you, you mentioned there in your talk about that soil moisture sense um, technology. Mm. Like, is that is that being adopted in a big way by by people in the UK growers? And like, how is it if it is? Like, how is it influencing the mm. decisions they make in terms of the programs? Does it does it have an influence in in cutting the interval between? applications of fungicides or does it what role does it play? Uh, it's more of a um it's more of an irrigation uh management decision you know it just supports decision making i suppose um you know there are several big growers who are using them um they're you know in potato crops um as well as yeah. the you know the outdoor lettuce we're using them on indoor baby leaves outdoor baby leaves um yeah it's just a decision support tool really i mean you know, some of these big companies, they haven't got quite the experienced growers on site that, you know, we might have had maybe 20 or 30 years ago, perhaps. Um, so it's just something to help the guys um, decide on whether they, when and if they need to irrigate. Um, and sort of prioritising, I suppose, when they're going around with big irrigation reels, um, sometimes it's difficult to decide where to go to first. So um, it's just it's just something that helps prioritize and, and schedule the irrigation a bit more efficiently really um yeah. all costs money doesn't it to pump water around a farm so 
Um, yeah. You know, if we can avoid one application, it you know it all helps at the end of the day. Um, as for scheduling, um, you know, fungicides, um, I tend to work more with the harvest side of um, of farms. So you know, we work to the harvest date, um, get our fungicides on with relation to um, you know when when the harvest manager wants to cut his crop. Um, and then the irrigation guys have to work around us. Right. Um, yeah, it's important to get the fungicides on, get the protection going, um, and yeah, make sure it's the, the crop is is free harvest interval wise um, when the uh, when the teams come to harvest. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, the the other one there. Sorry, Owen. Before I'll hand back to you, if you don't mind. Uh, you, you, the the other tool there, that Zensi, the the Fargrow tool, uh, again, like. Uh, What's your experience uh, of that with growers? Um, yeah. Is it being adopted? Are they using it? Yeah. Um, I saw it when it first came out. Uh, there was a company that were that were um, promoting it before um, Fargo took hold of it. Um, really good at promoting it. Um, you know, lots of information to uh, uh, to be bamboozled by, really, more than anything, I think. Um, and the grower I knew who took it on... Um, whether it overwhelmed him, I think, perhaps in the end, and, and then he couldn't see the wood for the trees in really. Um it's got a, it's you know it's great potential there. Um it just gives you another layer of um knowing what's going on in the crop. You can check your soil moisture deficits, your um, you know, uh, the environment, it checks the environment, it checks for wheat leaf wetness, um vapor pressure deficit, there's all sorts of things that you can combine. Um, you know, to give you that extra insight into how the crop's feeling on a day-to-day -day basis um, and perhaps record how a successful crop has done really well. You can then look back and say, yeah, you know, we, we influenced it well by, you know, doing X, Y, Z, um, but the crop next to it didn't do quite so well. Yeah, we can see why. Uh, we can see what, you know, the, the problems were with it. Um, okay. And I think, like I said, the far grow guys, um, you know, they're, they're often growers or agronomists themselves. So they understand growing as well as the technology um, that you know, the system will bring. So I think, you know, there's going to be, you know, some good collaboration is potentials out there, you know, for, for far growers to come around and speak to growers and actually get them to get the best out of those systems. So, um, yeah, I've seen it used. Um, the grower is a little bit too bamboozled by it, to put it bluntly. Um, and then, yeah, just couldn't see the benefit of it. But I think it'll come back. I think we'll, I think it'll yeah. be up for, you know, reigniting it again. So. Could, could I just ask uh, Andrew there, sorry, just in, in you had your program up there, which was a very, uh, look, it's, I know it's only an indicative program really uh, for the, the winter and the summer crops, but uh, very mm. interesting uh, all the same. Um, you know, you mentioned uh, Karma at the bottom, which, which you know, is, is a product that we have here, probably, you know, limited uh, experience using mm. it. But I, I suppose if if I'm a grower with um, that, that has, has got a problem, an issue has crept in, um, you know, what, what would you go to, to, to dry it up? Is that is that a product or there's phosphites there or there are other chemi chemical approaches or, or other approaches yeah. that you'd look at? Um, in an now, issue, in a, in a serious situation, I mean, what I... do you do? Right. Um, my internet connection is unstable. I'm just getting, so I hope I don't lose you. Um, no. But yeah, I'd go for go for Karma. It dries up the spores really well. Um, it's got a seven-day application interval. So, you know, you've got to apply it and then wait seven days before applying it again. Um, but in the instance of the rocket I referred to, um, again, it, a rocket is a really um, downy mildew-prone crop. Um, and we struggle with control um, every year. It's the same. I hate growing rocket, um, but certainly the Karma has added a, another level to to Danny mildew control. And as soon as we see a mildew start, you know, to appear on the on the on the leaves, we're out there with the Karma. Um, you know, perhaps for example, we we haven't quite finished applying the the full fungicide program. So let's say I'd apply my Parat or Revis on a Monday, for example. Um, and then, um, you know, a bit of crop walking after that, so I'll spot some spores, and then I'll be back in there on a Wednesday or a Thursday, perhaps with a karma, knocking those spores down. 
before I then carry on with the rest of my programme, you know, the following week. Um, I'd like to be able to use it more often. Seven days just about gives us control. I did a little trial where we did it, we applied it every three to four days and that knocked the spores off the leaves, no end. So it's got great potential, but unfortunately we're, our hands are tied as to how many times we can apply it. Um, you know, yeah. on a weekly basis. But that's yeah, brilliant. Karma's my, my go-to product for, for drying up a product, uh, that, drying up a problem. Yeah, that's that's really really interesting. Um, I'll just I, I'll just hand you over quickly to William. We're running out of time, but there's there's questions flying in. Uh, <laughs> a, a few yeah. a few quick ones there, William. Yeah, uh, just a quick one for John. Um, John, can have you an update on um your offering for organic seed there and and any advancements? Uh. <clears throat> We have um, organic seed of uh, of lettuce, uh, and to be honest with you, this has um, come via a couple of questions that have come out of Europrise today. Uh, we are formulating one for organic seeds, but what we see is the organic market is reducing in within Europe, and outdoor production is fine when that we can sustain that. But what we're seeing is in indoor production. Uh, the use of organic varieties is going less and less. And the problem with this is sustaining those organic varieties uh, production wise. It's like any box, you know, it's like any company. If we don't see any value of that, and mainly is just juice the organic market reducing, not just within the UK and Ireland, across Europe. Um, so I can answer that one. We, there are uh, varieties there. But it comes off the back of traditional breeding anyway. And if we find a, a value variety that's conventional, we'll put it into the or, organic because we have an organic company called Vitalysis, which is purely owned by, by Enza. There's a couple of other questions. I don't know whether you want me to answer those, William. So there was one on Jones. I noticed on the browning, that's purely physiological. Uh, we see it at certain times of the year, mainly the autumn and spring. And when you get a high temperature at night and you get the sudden intake of uh, nutrients through the soil. Basically, it's the browning of the vein. Some people call it brown rib. And it's it's purely physiological. I know it, it's it, it's not uh, pleasant looking on the vein. And this is coming back to Derek Farron on that one. Um, and yes, we see it's just a certain times of year and some varieties are prone to that. And to be honest with you, Going back to uh, Derek on that, I've not seen that on Jones. I've seen it on some of the gem varieties, but not on Jones. And you can see it one week, and then it disappears, and then another week it, it comes back. So it's it's we've seen it open field crops as well. So it's a difficult one to control. Some people will put magnesium on. Well, I can't recommend. You know, I'm going by what some growers prevent it by. Uh, some growers water heavily. But then if you water heavily, you've got the sudden intake of uh, nutrients and then burst the uh, cells on the vein itself. I hope that answers Derek's question on that one. And, you know, I can probably speak to John Cahill and uh, we can discuss that when I'm back over in Ireland in the new year. So, Great. Thanks, John. I'll hand you back to Owen. Uh, just uh, I suppose one final one. We're, we're we're kind of running out of time, but maybe just one, maybe two more. Um, uh, for for Andrew, I suppose. Uh, again, uh, what water volume, Andrew, would you recommend? Uh, for spraying, sorry, for for fungicide spraying. Yeah. Um. So generally, um, I'm aiming for. I want to say as low as possible. I like to get good coverage. Um, but I don't like to dilute the product too much. So. Uh, 350 litres of water per hectare is pretty much my go-to for everything, unless uh, the label states otherwise. There are certain products that stipulate 600. Um, the Crop Lift Pro I referred to um, as the foliar nutrition, um, that stipulates 1,000 litres of water um, to help alleviate scorch under protection. Um, if I'm incorporating a little bit of fungicide at the same time, then I'd go you know, 1,000 litres. Um, the essential thing is to get the crop dry, you know, at the end of the day, um, I've found. So, um, yeah, 350 as a standard, follow the label if it's any more than that. Um, and then often the handheld application equipment, um, the poor guys can't run quick enough to uh, to apply just 350. So 
sometimes we're having to go to six or seven hundred liters a hectare um you know just depending on the equipment so yeah yeah, yeah. but i suppose the, the the key message there is getting your water volume that you're that you're applying with those funders like getting the water volume right is important um and just I, i'll fly to just one last one and then i think we'll have to wrap up we're, we're roll, rolling over time here but um to, to either uh, andrew or john um what are your thoughts on plant tape or the alley pot systems instead of soil blocks for lettuce production i'm quite conversant with those types of machinery do you want me to answer that one andrew i don't know yeah you... go for it john yes so yeah there's quite use of um for indoor production can't recommend uh, you know if you've got a large enough greenhouse to put a uh, plant tape machine in into a greenhouse then uh, it will be useful but i think both systems are in the are there in, in their infancy plant tape is used quite a lot out in open field production not in glass house production i could see an advantage both for and mainly this is coming from peat, peat free uh, on the early pot system that could be adapted for glass house production as well as uh, open field production. Most of the, the research and uh, the trials that are being done on early pot systems are in open field and not on glass house production. Early pots is not a new system because it's been wildly, widely used in the ornamental industry for 30 plus years. Um, and now it's been adapted purely because of the peat free uh, issue coming into operation. So uh, several growers on several crops are using plant tapes in the UK as well as in Ireland. Um, and then early pot systems, it's been trialled with several growers this year with one plant raising nursery, I, I believe is Hillgate has got a sewing light dedicated to early pots. But um, yeah, it's large scale production on um with plant tape where the disadvantages there you can't you, you can't um gap up so if you're looking at glass house production and then open field production you anything above five percent gaps in in the field does become an issue so for high value crops mm. it, it's not mainly used for those yeah yeah, no, that's 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 really interesting, as you say, for field production, uh, harvest window or uh, planting windows, I suppose, out in outdoor production as well is a is a major advantage to speed you can get out uh, and get th get through the planting. But um, look, it's probably something that will evolve as as we look for a, for an alternative to to peat. They might come up with smaller systems that are suited to yeah. more suited to indoor production. But um, look, I I think uh, there's great questions coming in if if. We we've tried to get around as many as we can, but if there's any other burning questions, um, you know, either myself, William, and Andy can try to to answer them, or maybe Andrew or John, we might be able to to relay them on to you if, if that's okay. Um, for anyone that didn't get uh their question answered, um, but we've done our best. Uh, but we'll have to call it a wrap there. So, uh, thanks very much to our two speakers, John Johnson, um and Andrew Poole and then to my colleagues William DC and, and Andy Welton um, it's been a really uh, informative evening and uh, just to say the webinar will be the recording uh, will be posted uh, online within the next week or so um, so yeah that's it and thanks everybody for, for joining in and your, your participation is what makes these these uh, these very very useful so um, thank you and good night Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Uh, Thank Good night. Thanks very Good night, much. Everybody. Bye bye. Yeah.